Welcome everyone to the introduction to Log4j 2.0. Um, we're excited about this release. We're uh, working on the general availability, general availability release right now. Uh, it's currently in release candidate stage, although you could pretty much use it in production uh, as long as you're not expecting really good OSGI support because we're still a little unsure on how to do that. Anyway, I'd like to start with going over the history between, behind logging and log4j. In the beginning, we've, uh, we had system.out and system.air. In fact, a lot of people still use that. It's the most simple <laughs> logging system there is. But there wasn't really any other way to do it besides just using a print stream, maybe using uh, a shell to redirect your output to uh, different files, maybe add in a log rotate script for that, um, or maybe make a debug sort of system-wide property that you'd use to check to um, prevent printing out messages you didn't want, doing calculations on strings to print out that you didn't want to do, helped uh, with performance. But a lot of people are still stuck in this or just try to use a debugger. But I feel as though logging is rather important to, to uh, any running system that's more complex than Hello World, really. So the original kind of uh, logging system would be something more like this. What you would do is get a system property to uh, check uh, if you're in debug mode or not using uh, just standard print stream objects to print out your uh, different Log messages really only gave you two priorities because of two standard output streams. And if you caught a, an exception, you could just call print stack trace on it. Now, practically every line of code in here, a static code in the analyzer will scream at you for doing any of these things because you should be using a logging framework. So back in the day, the original Log4j project was created by, um, I don't know how to pronounce his name, I'm sorry, Seki Gilko, I'm gonna go with. And it's provided a nice hi named hierarchy of loggers that you could categorize your logging messages based on where they were coming from. So you had a much better method of being able to filter them, um, being able to have different severity levels, kind of like how Apache HTTP server works. And you could easily configure this using a properties file or an XML file that even had a DTD to help you validate it. You could also programmatically configure log4j. And there, were plenty, and there were several appenders you could use to save your log messages somewhere. So example, migrating from our original logging, or lack thereof, we could just use a logger class to get a named logger. Oftentimes you would name it after the class, so you might just go um, get class.getName. You were given uh, debug, info, warn, error, and fatal levels. Although fatal is rarely used, it generally should mean that nothing can go on, like your system can't continue. Um, there was a, also for every logging message type, you could include a throwable, and that was configurable whether or not you wanted to see that in the log or how much of it you wanted to see in the log, because oftentimes there's a huge stack trace of irrelevant calls, and that just clutters the logs. Uh, I've seen log files where it's like three or four pages of a stack trace, just like four caused bias, and most of it's irrelevant. Later on, the same guy who made Log4j decided to go off and make his own project called SLF4j with the implementation of Logback. Some neat little features he added to this was making parameterized logging messages. So instead of having to manually construct your string to log, you could just put in some curly brace placeholders and add as parameters afterward. It, originally it was just an object array, but later when Java added the uh, variable argument to uh, methods, they added support for that. So as long as you upgrade to a recent SLF4J API version, you're able to get more convenient placeholder usage. They also added the concept of markers, which kind of give you a more of a kind of cross-cutting logger naming thing. It gives you a new way to filter things. Um, so you might like use that for uh, initialization or uh, destruction code, sort of like cross-cutting concerns. So it works well with aspect-oriented programming if you ever do that. And one of the big things it did, of course, was separating the API from the implementation, which was, um, which was new to log for which was different from log4j, which just provided a single package to use, or a single uh, artifact. And with SLF4j, you got a simple provider, which is just logged to the console. They had logback, which was their implementation, 
And they also gave you an option to bridge to other logging systems like Log4j or the uh, new in Java 1.4, the Java Util Logging, which is kind of a build your own logging system, uh, logging system, and Apache Commons Logging. Uh, I believe you could also use uh, JBoss Logging, but JBoss Logging maintains all of their implementations on their side. So updating what we were doing, we can, we're calling a new class called Logger Factory instead of just the logger to get our name logger once again. And we can use, as you can see, the curly braces. We can parameterize our messages, which you don't really see very often of having a, a message on its own like that. It's convenient here, of course. But it's usually, you'd usually have that written in line so you can add in the parameters of what else you wanted to include. It's, what, it's also good because it, it helps prevent the need to concatenate strings together when logging is disabled at that level. And of course, it still, cont it still contains the same way to add a throwable to the end of the list. Even if you're using parameter, even if you're using the, um, what you call it, the variable argument parameters, if the last argument's a throwable and there was no placeholder for it, it'll include that as the throwable. And that brings us to log4j2. Now, this was originally created by another fellow developer, Ralph Goers, to address all these SLF4J limitations in both their API and, their, uh, and in the logback implementation. There, so originally, he tried to contribute these as patches to SLF4J and logback, but um, Goku did not want them. I guess they were just not along his uh, philosophy of logging. So there were some new, thing, some new features that, he, that uh, Goers had really wanted was there was a new syslog, the new expanded syslog format that added tons of more new information because the normal syslog format's really basic. Like, it doesn't really offer a whole lot of information. It's basically just kind of a way to categorize a log message and with no identifying information, no standardization, really. And RFC 5424 added a bunch more information you could use with syslog and network logging. There was another, another important aspect was allowing you to change your configuration while your program is running and not lose log messages in the process. Kind of defeats the purpose of logging if you lose log messages, right? So there was a, as, as sort of a design pattern standpoint, we had to decouple loggers and the configuration for the loggers using sort of a bridge pattern so that when you change the configuration and stop and start things again, the messages can continue being passed without having to worry about destro destroying the logger object itself. Another neat feature added was the idea that sometimes an appender might fail. Like, let's say it's a file appender and it runs out of disk space and on, and on that partition. Or if it's a network-based logger, it might not be able to connect to the network. It might not be able to connect to wherever it's supposed to send a message. Now, in SLF4J, that's ignored. It just doesn't care. It just kind of expects everything to work out. And it required a little a bit of API rework in order to do that. But now there's a failover appender that'll allow you to configure fallback appender sort of things that'll log your message just in case your main logging system fails. So you might want to use that, for instance, uh, if, you're, if you have network-based logging of some sort, let's say you're using one of, uh, let's say, the TCP or UDP sockets uh, loggers and you're not able to connect to the central logging instance that you're trying to keep it going to. Well, you could log them locally so you can gather them up later. Or you might fall back to using, or let's say you're using JMS maybe, and you're not able to connect to JMS. Well, you can fall back to using Flume. And then there was a lot of performance, a lot of focus on performance. There's a lot of locking, like a lot of just global locking that goes on in, in SLF4J. And instead, in Log4j2, we went up the route of using, lower, the, using Java Util Concurrent, uh, the locks and atomic and every, everything to make things much more performant and requiring far less synchronization. This logging should really add minimal overhead to your system, especially when you have logging disabled. So we put a lot of focus on making sure that it's as fast as possible. We also have a neat plugin interface that allows you to create your own plugins, whether it be uh, penders, filters, lookups for, uh, for like property style string lookups, uh, various other things. They're all, you can, all has a neat little interface you can use with 
annotations in a static factory method. Uh, we're working on improving that API, but it's, it's pretty easy to at least make one. So here we go with um, how it would look now in log4j2. We've switched over, we have a central class called log manager, which is what you'll, which is where you usually get a logger. And one of the neat little features that's not shown here is that you can just call it with no arguments and it will just find whatever class called it and make that the name of the logger. It's using reflection on the first time. So save yourself some typing. It's a pretty common pattern to always name your logger after the class, so that's the default if you don't give it any parameters. We still have the same uh, message levels. Trace is also available and Fatal is also available. And we also have a few more that are kind of similar to the things you found in Java Util logging, like catching an exception, throwing an exception, ent method entry, method exit. So those are all by default logged on the trace level, but you can also configure that. Now we have the main idea here. This is a diagram you can find on the Log4j2 documentation. It kind of shows a UML diagram of how things flow. So essentially, we have a logger context, which you can have multiple of. That will that keep track of loggers in a particular runtime environment, and these loggers will connect with a the logger config bridge class between a configuration and a logger. You can apply filters at many different points to um, exclude or include log messages. Logger configs send messages to appenders, which are configured through the configuration, and an appender has a layout knowing how it's what how what data format it's supposed to come out as. So going through that, once again, we have the log manager, which is our root of the logging system. On initialization, we look for a provider for log4j. So if it can't find one, there is a simple fallback that just uses the console by default. So if you see that error and you know you included a class, the, uh, an implementation, you might have something wrong with your class path. So we use that to get loggers. You can also get the logger context, which are mostly relevant, let's say, on a, say you have a shared environment with multiple web containers and each web container has its own log configuration, well each web container has its own logger context. There's also a way to create a logger that instead of using the uh, curly brace style parameterized messages, it uses more of a printf style using the same format you'd find in um, all the printf methods in various systems, which is also possible to do using some other API trickery. But we have loggers, of course, same as every other framework. Good practice to make a private static final logger, although if it's an abstract class, you might make it protected so that your subclasses can use the same logger if that matters. And as I said before, you can just call it without any parameters to get it named after the class they called it, which is a pretty standard way to do it, so we figured to make it easy. You have uh, several levels, of course, to log messages. In fact, Customizable levels are a concept that's in progress so that you can both add your own levels that uh, fit in this hierarchy, or you might even be able to rename them. Uh, interesting concept I saw was uh, renaming the, all the different logger uh, levels to like DEFCON 1, DEFCON 2, DEFCON 3. So like if whatever system you want to use, you'll be able to convert it to that. So there's also, like I said, similar to job util logging, we have the uh, catching, Logger.throwing, which will actually return the throwable, so you can just you can throw logger.throwing. It's pretty neat. Logger.entry to uh, indicate the entry to the method. You can add all the arguments to it. Doesn't have to. Logger.exit. If there, if it's a void method, just logger.exit, no parameters. If it has parameters, you can return logger.exit with the return value. Good way to keep track of things. Also a good uh, point to use with a, um, aspect J would probably be good for this because otherwise I've tried manually typing these out in some code and then it's no fun. But it is a good, it is a nice thing to have when you need it. So the loggers are named in a hierarchy similar to package names. So like org is the parent of org.apache, which would be the parent of org.apache.logging, and so forth, which means they also inherit configurations unless you specify otherwise. And there's also a root logger, which is the default logger, which just has no name or a blank name, which you can just call get root logger. There's also a root logger name. I don't think it'll ever change from a blank string, but if it did, it'd be a good idea not to assume it is. You can configure your loggers based on this hierarchy as you have before. 
and you can choose where to filter things on several on several points based on log na uh, logger names, the logger hierarchy, and so forth. So we brought in the concept of markers from SLF4J, which we found to be rather useful. Although we made them rather immutable to, for performance reasons, because otherwise we'd have to add a lot more synchronization. There's some work in progress to make uh, make it so you can dynamically add more markers, but it's good to uh, it's good it's for, for the purposes I've even used it. I've never found a need to actually get more complicated than just simply name markers. They're independent from loggers, so you can share them amongst many loggers. So like I said, good for cross-cutting concerns, an aspect-oriented logging. Uh, so anytime you're logging in, let's say, an aspect J class, you probably want to use a marker for it because otherwise you just have it named after the class itself. And maybe you don't want to create a logger every time you, uh, let's say, doing a round, of, a round invoke or something like that. So similarly to the log manager, there's a marker manager. You can also inherit markers from each other so that they, you can, for more filtering. And a pretty, pretty simple and useful concept that might not make sense at first because it's something that's kind of new to logging, but it, it's something that people have wanted for sure. Now we have our anchor point of logging systems, the logger context, like I was saying. Uh, they, there can be multiple ones active, so you can have different configurations going on that do not conflict. So this is useful if, for instance, you put log4j2 in your Tomcat lib, and you want all the different auras to be able to use it so you don't have to keep redeploying it everywhere. Well, now you can at least have, all the wars can have their own separate configurations that don't interact with each other. We get, we'll uh, keep track of existing loggers as you create them. Uh, if you configure a logger in the configuration file, it'll also preload creating that logger so it's already ready for you to use, and we can use what's called a context selector to find which logger context is appropriate for you. So the usual, usual way you'd keep track of uh, logger context, let's say outside of a EE environment, might be just use a class loader to associate with the context. So maybe in an OSGI environment where each bundle gets its own class loader, that would be a good way to keep track of the configurations per, per context or in a web container or Java EE container, you'd use, you, can use name, you can name the contexts and have them looked up and have them stored through JNDI so you can, you can uh, share your logger configuration amongst many servers if you wish to. I've never really used JNDI that in depth like that, but it does seem like a neat idea. We also have a configuration object. This, this finally reaches where only part of the core API. It's not part of the main log4j API, this is something specific to the log4j implementation. This is where we parse your configuration. You can also programmatically create it. And we currently support XML, JSON, and YAML for your configuration file format. They all follow the same general structure, and in fact, the XML structure is a, a pretty loose, allowing you to specify things either as attributes or nested elements. There is a strict XML mode that if you want, want to, let's say, add an XSD, to uh, verify your files. Now, as I mentioned earlier, in order, to, in, or, in order to enable reconfiguring loggers, this is separate from the logger itself, and are tied together with the logger config. So another neat little thing we have, something that's common with, with uh, frameworks like Spring, having property placeholders for uh, looking up something at the last second when you need it. So for instance, let's say you're specifying your logger layout and you want to include some extra information, you could throw in a, a variable there. Or maybe you want to configure the uh, levels or filters that way, you can just put them in through, you can put them in through properties. And we can find this through, you know, you, could, you can look up variables through environment system properties, JNDI, from your server context, you can store things through map diagnostic context, context or nested diagnostic contexts or as the class is called in log4j, thread context map. Now this is part of the regular API. Uh, map messages for if you just have a map of information you want to send in a particular message, you can use that to add, to configure particular information on the fly. There's also structured data messages. I'm honestly not sure what that is. But that's uh, a whole other part of the API for something similar, something related to syslog, I believe. So, uh, as I said before, we have the logger config that represents the logger elements in a configuration file. And 
you can have one configuration going to many different loggers using these logger configs. You can filter your log messages through this part. Uh, let's see, you, some interesting ways of filtering besides just through the level, logger levels. You can uh, choose like filters, do dynamic threshold filters. You can filter based on regular expressions on the message itself. You can use the thread context map information to whether or not you want to log it. A lot of neat little things there. And the logger config gets that message. So now we, now we need to put that log message somewhere for it to be useful. We can't just store it in memory. So we have appenders, which are used to route log messages to a physical destination. So each, each appender has a layout, which would be something like a pattern layout, for instance, where, which is what most people are pretty familiar with when you specify sort of like a printf style string indicating which parts of the log message or log event you want to log. Um, you can add, log, your appenders are additively configured, so like you can, so for instance, if you have a configuration for the root logger, and then you have a configuration for org.apache, the org.apache logger hierarchy will be configured both for that and for the root logger. So you have to specify additivity equals false if you just want to use a specific configuration that you're overriding. That's something to keep in mind because otherwise you'll be wondering why your debug messages are showing up in the main log. So we have some, um, a lot of neat appenders out of the box. The important ones, of course, we got the console output. We got file output with uh, several ways to configure that, such as uh, log rotation, automatic compression of these rotated files, rotating based on time, date, size, can uh, just make an, out, an arbitrary output string if, uh, if um, you really wish to do that. It's a pretty easy way to make a plug in that way. You have many different ways to send your log messages through the network. You got a, like a TCP and a UDP server that you can make a server and a client so you can have a, a single log4j instance on a server that receives all the log messages from all your other servers. So that's pretty handy in a cloud environment. You also support uh, sys network syslog, which is nice for the sysadmins if they uh, care about the log messages in this case. And Apache Flume, which is a really neat project. We have ways to uh, message through that. And we have some other networking things. And then on the EE side, you can set up an SMTP appender to, let's say, send you your error messages. Every, uh, after it collects a few error messages, you get emailed about it in case something's going wrong. You can, mess you can route your messages through JMS. So if you're already using ActiveMQ or something like that, you can uh, keep everything all nice and uh, centralized like that. You can store it to a database through JPA or uh, NoSQL. Currently, we support MongoDB and CouchDB although it's rather simple to extend that. And we also support some other uh, Java EE frameworks in that regard. Like you can use JDBC as long as you're using a data source and not a driver, because the drivers are notoriously a bad idea to use directly. And as I mentioned earlier, we have to fail over appenders in case the appender can't do what its job is. And then one of the also, one of the also neat features is we have much, much improved asynchronous logging now using this neat thing called the LMAX disruptor. See here, we need a graph to show this. When you add a lot of threads for your asynchronous logging, it has a much higher throughput. Even if you mix together using only some of your logs, logs are using asynchronous, and you're using some synchronous ones, it still works fine. Now, let's see. This is a weird kind of chart. But if you compare this to the uh, asynchronous logging in logback, though, you can see um, it's kind of a big difference. It makes it a big difference with, uh, you can't just make the appender asynchronous. It requires a whole asynchronous logging system. Choosing which log messages you want, rather useful. We have filters for that. There's plenty of different contextual information you can use to filter your log messages, which, uh, you can put in to many places. You can apply to specific loggers. You can specify to specific configurations of a logger, so let's say a logger out, uh, entry in your config file. You can specify it on particular appender configurations to filter out. You can also filter out specific appenders themselves. There's a, there's a little difference in that. Now the, useful part here 
are patterns, of course, of what information you want to actually log because there's, besides your log message and possibly a throwable that you've added to it, there's some other information you can get, you can dynamically calculate using some uh, runtime reflection if you really want to. Like for instance, you can get the class, the, uh, the class that, threw, that logged the message, so if it's not named after the logger, you can find out what class did it, what method called the logger, location in the file that it was being logged from. That stuff's kind of slow though, naturally. So I, I, I recommend figuring out a better way of doing that. Uh, you, can, you can keep track of thread names if that's actually useful. Um, it could be useful in a very highly concurrent environment, especially if you have a neat thread naming system. Of course, you can have date and time in several different formats. And there's the map diagnostic context information, which you can also include in your log. You normally would use these patterns with a pattern layout, which is for just general text. But your layouts, though, give you different ways to store, to basically unmarshal your log event into some information and store it somewhere. So you can add, you specify headers and footers to your log files. Um, but besides using just a plain text, we have some other neat layouts. Uh, as mentioned before, we have syslog and the new syslog layouts, which are pretty standardized. You can store as an HTML file. You can customize the CSS on that and get a neat look in HTML log file. We can just store them as XML files, kind of like Java Util logging likes to do. Or you can even just uh, store them as JSON files. You, in fact, later on, you'll be able to pass around your log messages on the network using these, let's say, XML and JSON to instead of just uh, serializing it over in a binary format. Or you can uh, just get a serialized layout if, you have, if you're trying to store it binary-wise and do analysis on it through Java. Be pretty simple to do it through there. And that is Log4j 2.0 coming to you soon. Please check out the release candidate and give us some feedback. Uh, do I have any questions? How soon? We are trying to get this out probably. I can't really say. It's a, we have, as opposed to Log4j1, we don't have just one developer anymore, but now we have about six or seven. So, sometimes, so some of us are working on things we want to get included that we want to make sure is there before we have to have, freeze the API. So we're working on that. I think we'll have a, another release candidate probably within the next couple of weeks or month. And so it should probably, I, I would hope it would be out, let's say, by June. Don't quote me on that, but quote me on that. I think June is a good time. Yes? Uh, what are some of your current struggles with integrating it with an OSPI cache? OK, well, for one, we would prefer to keep like our log4j core module as one module for ease of development purposes. Uh, we already kind of use a modular like package. We already use packages, but rather modularly. So it, logically, it could be split into several bundles, because right now we just kind of have optional dependencies. So if you're plugging, if a plugin calls a class that doesn't exist, that plugin can't be loaded, that's fine. In an OSGI environment, we'd want to be able to dynamically register that stuff. And we, but it's basically kind of like fighting Maven to try to figure out how to generate all the bundles we want. So currently, we have some, we have some split out bundles, but it doesn't work very well. I can't really, and nobody at Log4j really has a lot of OSGI experience. I, I kind of came on and tried to add some stuff, but I'm still pretty new to OSGI. So I don't really, I haven't, I don't really even uh, know exactly how it should be used. I know, with, I know I'd like to add in a, a um, OSGI logging system uh, implementation so you can use that instead. Because I know uh, in Felix that they have an implementation and SL4J has an implementation and something we're lacking on. But basically we just need some more, um, someone with OSGI expertise who know, really knows how to play around the corner cases of OSGI. Because uh, this project wasn't made with that in mind and we don't want to make hard dependencies on it. Yes? So last year we, we made the decision to move to SLF4J and log mm -hmm. And for our product, it's a Tomcat-based product, and uh, we need multiple web applications to share the same log file, so we put that into the create and create the log in the Tomcat compiler. Mm -hmm.
Yes, actually, uh, I don't, for some reason, I don't think I actually included that here, but basically we have bridges for using, to pull you from the old log4j 1.2. We have a bridge for SLF4j both ways. We have one, so if you want to log to SLF4j, and there's uh, that. If you want to log from SLF4j, we also have an implementation for that. And you can, put, you can include that. You can, if you want to use uh, Java util logging, you can basically combine the SLF4j Java util logging with the log4j, SLF4j. And with commons logging, there is another bridge for that. And in your situation, I might recommend that you'd have like a named logger, like if you want to use the same configuration on all of them, this might be a good point to use with, your, with a JNDI lookup. So you'd, make, you'd name your logger config and be able to access that also. It doesn't conflict with any other logger configs. So in the future, if you have an open source project that's using log4j2, it's not going to clobber your configuration. How are we doing on time here? No, it's, uh, oh, really? <laughs> more, more, less code for me to look after and more code for other people. <laughs> yeah. Um, so it's, it's certainly doable. You just need to be quite careful of how you keep people wary of trying to get a name for anything that other than it's probably not going to fit. As long as you've got those things in mind, yeah, it's got to be a fit. Real quick. Uh, Yeah? Well, in part two, Nick Williams is here too, so he might be able to help. I don't think there's a specific best practice. There's multiple ways to do it. It kind of depends on which thing you may already have in place or which way is most convenient for you. So if you have nothing in place, the easiest thing to set up would probably be the TCP or UDP socket appenders, which that way you can just have another program running on a server that listens for that, and everything else can just send their messages to that. Now, if you want to set up Apache Flume, which is really neat for this, it's a, actually a really good system for passing along log messages. I highly, have to highly recommend trying that out. Of course, that does take setting up Apache Flume, which is 
a little harder than setting up log for j. Uh, if you're in a Java EE environment, like if you're already using JMS, you can pass your messages through there, have another thing that pulls them in and saves them that way. Um, or another way that I, one way that I've been looking at doing at my job is having all our log messages go to a MongoDB instance and just being able to pull them out from there. So that way uh, we can pull out just the latest log messages for Splunk to index and not have to, do, not have to pay them a billion dollars to log, to filter out like a terabyte of log messages. So it, there's a lot of neat things you can, tons of different places you can put it. But generally, you probably want to use a combination of a failover appender if you're not using a reliable networking system. But Apache Flume is pretty reliable, um, at least in its message passing from uh, point to point. So. Yeah. You might want to use something like Flume. <laughs> uh, try to make it simple to network things together, though. That's why there's so many different ways to do it. How many log messages we're talking about here? I want to. Yeah, I mean, like if it, if you want to log everything. That could be a lot, especially if you're tracing things and adding in aspect-oriented uh, logging. It could build up really fast. Yeah. One little pet peeve of mine is that um, if you want to print out a log message that gets sent out, and, and it may just be that I just don't know the mechanism to do this, I log with error, so then in the message, in the log file, it says error there for something that's really informational. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, well, uh, that's, a, that's a good use for markers, actually. You can, you can just abuse the logging levels and just kind of disregard what they mean and just pull in markers for different things that you want to do. Uh, another, yeah, I mean, you can choose on all, you can configure per, like, package even. Per, that's perfect use for a marker, actually. You can also um, use the dynamic threshold filters to kind of mix and match which levels you want to allow. So if you create like a config level, but you still don't want to allow warning messages and only want error message in config, you just set up a dynamic threshold filter to only allow through those two levels. Otherwise, it's sort of a, uh, you know, you choose a level and that's the minimum level that's accepted. No, that's how that's how it's currently done. Okay. That's um, it's one of the big advantages of using the uh, parameterized logging messages, so that the uh, the object's not getting uh, recalculated out, serialized into strings or internally stored as a byte array until it's needed to be laid out somewhere. Right, because you mentioned the use cases for serialized objects. Uh, that's a huge. That's one of the. Um, yeah. 
SLF4J does a similar thing. They just have a lot more synchronization going on. It slows things down. Yeah, that's a language limitation, I would say. I mean, it might be, might be easier in the future with lambdas to make it so you don't have to evaluate it until it's called. That's, um, who knows, I mean, who here is actually using Java 1.8 in their <laughs> work? Well, like, we gotta wait <laughs> one day. It was a gigantic amount. No, that's, like I said, that's a, that's a limitation of Java. If you could surround it in a Lambda, that would work. It gives me a good idea, though. We might add a way to specify some sort of reflective thing, like maybe an interface to, that would resemble a Lambda, because while we support Java 1.6, so we'd like to be able to do this without Lambdas, but in a way that would work in the future with lambdas for a much easier syntax. So that way, it doesn't have to evaluate your uh, information you're trying to get. Because what if you need to do a database lookup or something like that, you know, and logging is disabled? Currently, the best bet is you still should do a log, regard, uh, log level check. But um, even on that regard, it's not always how things get filtered based on their level. So that to get the full filtering effect, it's just automatically done at the uh, level of, the, of each uh, method. It was for a little bit because it was trying to figure out if there was uh, parts of the log4j API that would have to be changed. And we didn't want to, of course, we didn't want to change the API after we released 2.0. So that was a small concern, but we've also had some other things we wanted to do about the API before it was uh, released. We want to make sure we have what we really want and what people can really use to be useful. And I think part of it is also just uh, only a few people who work on it, so even bringing up the topic of, hey, should we release this? It's like, it doesn't come up very often. <laughs> like, I brought it up recently about making another release candidate, and I think we'll probably have another one relatively soon. I, I, think, I think they're planning on rolling it actually. The release candidate? Yeah. All right. Yeah, so we're just trying to get a couple new things added into that before we put that out and get some more testing done, make sure that if we're not leaking memory anywhere. Is a weird little situation right now that, um, I mean, Tomcat might be able to help us out with that. Uh, if you try to register a shutdown hook, thread hook, that obviously doesn't ever get executed until Tomcat shuts down itself. But we can't even unregister a shutdown hook if it gets registered. Yeah, we're trying. We're, right now, we're trying to make it so that it won't add it anyway if you're in a web environment. But such a thing might even be useful if you're doing it at the Tomcat level. Because it's like when Tomcat shuts down, it wants to shut down everything. Okay. Mm -hmm. 
Mm. Yeah, and it's just, right now it's basically a setting in a configuration file, which is uh, kind of unnecessary. I, one setting we used to have actually was a way to scan for your additional plugins you might add. So you'd specify the packages you wanted to scan because otherwise it would try, otherwise the only option was to scan everything. And who knows how long that will take, right? Well, recently we added a Java annotation processor that will pre-compile all this data just like you, we had a, another system before, which still currently in there, where you just kind of do like an exec, maybe an exec task, let's say, on the, this class that would preload all the plugin names and class names and everything for you. Uh, right now we're handling it automatically. If you pull in log4j core as a dependency, when you compile, it'll pre-compile any uh, pl plugin annotations that you're using so that it knows where to find everything when the system starts. Yes? This might, for um, sharing loggers, are you, are you saying like sharing, uh, trying to use the same logging for multiple different components that are all linked in a chain? No, oh, uh, so, wait, so like let's say a single class had multiple loggers but one way to call it, are you uh, saying? Oh, the, I, actually, this sounds like a good point to use one of several things. Like you said, a database might be a good place, so you could use JPA or NoSQL for logging to a database to get that. Or you might log it to a JMS provider, so you can uh, pull that, like uh, let's say make a topic or queue for that, and you can uh, pull for that to get your messages that way uh, as needed. Um, if you're talking about configuring things, having like a master configuration, this would fall back to something like a JNDI where you name your uh, configuration. It'd be a nice way to do that too. Does that help? Okay. I work in a project called Gora, which is storage abstraction for DOM and NoSQL stores. Mm -hmm. So we support dead easy APIs to push data to all these different backends. And when I saw the release of 2.0 Log4j, mm -hmm. What, what back, I, I've just, I've been doing other things and I apologize okay. that I've missed the presentation. What back ends do you support? And you, you're talking about stuff being useful. Would it be useful to log data in different back ends depending on how you might want to query your logging data? Would, mm -hmm. it, would it be beneficial to Log4j to have a contribution that would use Gora to then specify where you would like your logging to be written to? And Subsequently read from. I haven't heard of that project, but that sounds like that would be handy. Right now, we support MongoDB and CouchDB uh, through some through a library called LightCouch. Right. Mongo, we just use Mongo driver. Right. Um, if you, you're saying this is a project with generic NoSQL so support, we, we support Amazon DynamoDB, HBase, Cassandra, MongoDB, Lucene, Solar. Um, what else have we got? Avro flat files, <coughs> sequence files. Another couple of stores. Mm -hmm. So it's generic ob object representation using Avro. Mm -hmm. It's uh, the SQLization format. Oh, we so do. I, I know we, because of our Flume appendage, we do have uh, Avro support on, as one of our serializations and also just generally serializing them using a log event class. Right. Uh, so, so we also wrap a, a library called Juke, J O O Q, mm -hmm. which is a 
think supports about nine or ten different sequel stores. Mm -hmm. So effectively, if, if we were to write the component for Lord for J and have Gora as the storage abstraction, then you could write your logs to potentially 15, 20 different um, back-end stores yeah. and able to access it in a uh, abstract manner. Mm -hmm. But only if it's going to be useful to people in order to do so. <coughs> I don't have a use case right now for requiring to get logs back from, for example, Cassandra. Mm -hmm. But some people might might have that use case. I don't know. Like to read the logs from it too? Right. Okay. Right and read, depending on maybe if it's Cassandra, you might need to read Clicker or, or you might need to write Clicker depending on your your client code or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. So that might be a better use case than, for example, maybe writing to HBase or MongoDB or something like that, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, would it would that be a, a valued contribution? I think so. Um, we were, we like to pull in um, more appenders to our project <coughs> instead of having everything fragmented up because then it becomes impossible for them to all upgrade their appenders. Because our API compatibility with Log4j 1.2, for instance, is basically if you're just calling the API, not necessarily if you wrote a plugin for it. Right. Although we do have a lot of plugins to replace things, and we definitely be uh, useful like if there's a use case and people want it we'd like to add those kind of things right. like uh, try to avoid adding anything we don't need right all right everybody uh, one more question what effect does this asynchronous logging have on the order log on the system log? um i'm not entirely sure but you can they're all time stamped you should use a time stamp it so they'll come out in date or time order <laughs> all right thank you everybody for coming and uh, please try out Lucky Jack. <laughs>